Now, I asked Megan earlier, uh, what's the makeup of the crowd? What are people doing here? So she said, why don't you ask people uh, and, and let's poll the audience. So I want to see a show of hands. How many of you today have already deployed a mobile app? Okay. How many of you have a .m mobile site, a version of your website? Okay. Less hands went up. Now I'm going to ask three questions around level of maturity from just getting started in mobile strategy, intermediate, or you think you're advanced. So I'd love to hear, and, and don't be shy, how many think you're that you're just getting started in the, in the novice? Okay, about half, a little more than half the room. And how about intermediate? Okay, and then the advance. Okay, maybe I should hire you. <laughs> Great. Okay, so it looks like we have a lot of people that are getting involved into uh, the programs uh, now. So what I wanted to talk today about is how to think bigger about building a mobile strategy. Yesterday I heard there's a lot of discussions around which platform should we do? Which features should we put on our app? But I want to think bigger about thinking about the entire customer lifecycle in the mobile, in the, uh, in the real world space. So this is a great way to kick off today and think about the entire customer experience. Now, quickly, mobile matters, and we know this through the, uh, the, the business case, and I'm gonna go through just some of the, the data points that are really showing the growth in this space. Uh, looking way back, these tools started off just as two-way, like advanced radios, and this one right here is over 2.5, uh, pounds, $4,000. And if you had this back then, you were cool. You were so cool. <laughs> uh, and they continue to evolve. So mobile has come a long way when it comes to just the technology, the size, the capabilities, and the features. Now, it's not just that it's a mobile device, but really, this is a computer in our hands. The amount of information and can be processed, right? Uh, even when I'm on the plane, I can still do a lot of things with the information that's there. So it's, a, it's really, uh, you have so much power right in your hands. Now, adoption-wise, we got some of this data from the Mashable site, and I know Ben Parr, my friend, was here yesterday, and I heard he did a smashing job. And the, you can see the mobile growth on the green line there, iPhone and iTouch, just launched a mere four years ago. Um, is just continuing to skyrocket in adoption. And we're also seeing that the total amount of sales of devices, mobile as well as uh, tablets, are starting to overtake desktop and laptop sales. So we have no choice to look at how our customers have fragmented into all of these different experiences. Now, that was setting up the business case, and I know you all of it, you know this, and you have that information, and a lot of stats have been shared. Now, one of the challenges that many companies we're talking to is trying to figure out how do we build a real strategy beyond just the features, beyond just the app du jour. So we wanted to talk to you today about the building your mobile marketing strategy. Now, first, this is the building blocks, and I'm going to spend some time today Looking at all of these different components, let's start on the left-hand side first. These are the features. So I'll go through them, and then the right-hand column, I'll tell you how do we use them. So it's important that any time we think about features, we line this up to the insights and how that we use. So first of one, uh, GPS. The location brings a lot of context to where we're actually going to be connecting with customers. Two, these devices allow for a tactile experience. So the touch, this is a unique experience that, that the desktop and the laptops really haven't provided in the past. You can use these tools to feel things. And this third one just started to appear, and we started to see a lot more of this, the sensors. What am I talking about? Anybody here have color.com installed? What do you think? OK. So if only a few hands had their uh, raised for color.com. Let me explain what it is. So they raised $43 million, and a lot of them come from, uh, the founders came from Photobucket and other places. So they have a track record of success. And what this app does is it allows you to take photos with your mobile device. iPhone is, the, I think, the primary. And what it does is it listens through the audio mic and looks at the ambient light in the room 
to figure out where are you. And then it matches with other people that you may not know that are in that area and are able to figure out, are you in the same room together? Exciting? Contextual? Scary, Scary she said. So these are the new sensors. Uh, and one caveat uh, was in a debate with the founders. They don't record what you're saying, but they're just grabbing a WAV file and they look at this pattern, and if somebody else has that pattern, then they're able to match. So this is what's called an implicit social graph. That's a lot of jargon, but let me explain what that means. It means it's able to figure out who are your friends, or who's been to that concert, or to that sporting event with you, and start to connect you with other people, even if you didn't know that. Now, for marketers, this is a dream. This means that we can find people like me, other consumers, even if they don't actually know each other. So the amount of contextual information around that is very high. So that's a new technology set that we're seeing out of mobile, is what we call these, these ambient sensors. And the goal is that they can understand the physical intelligence. OK, so that's just one building block. That's a new building block we're starting to see. But there's going to be a lot more that appear over time. Now, I'm often asked, is, and I was asked to sort of address this today, how do we integrate our mobile with our social strategy? And when I was looking at all of the titles here today, you know what? Only three people actually had mobile in their title on the list. Did you know that? Um, more people have social in their title, or emerging media, or digital, or product, or consu consumer, or marketing. So I know that we're, most of us are thinking at a, a broader perspective of the digital experience. So the question is, um, how does social integrate with mobile? And it's really important to note that you cannot have a social strategy without tying in mobile. However, you can definitely have a mobile strategy and not need to worry about social. Because the experience can just be one way, parsing information. It doesn't need to be social. But if you do have an existing social media program, you must factor in how does mobile and all of these features that you're seeing here come into play. So that fourth building block, the contact, that is around the personal information and then where people can connect to each other. If you've seen any of the trust research out there, we know that consumers trust each other more than they trust brands. Consumers trust each other more than they trust marketers. So that's a very important building block to factor into your mobile strategy. And then last, this is sort of a given, that because these things are portable, you can take this wherever you go, consumers wherever they go, and this pr provides a moment of context, a lot of contextual information. We could talk about the future as we, t uh, as we roll up the Q&A. So this slide, very important, and again, you'll have these slides. These are the components, the building blocks that you need in order to build your strategy. And you'll notice that I took it out of the, the technical realm, but just focused on the features and the benefits of the features. Altimeter will be updating this list. There's, going to be, there's definitely more features that we didn't bring today, and there's going to be more things that will start to appear into these components. So bringing this back to our customer strategy, and that's the bigger thing that we're going to discuss and kick off this morning, is thinking about how we perceive the world as marketers, as the marketing funnel. And this is the marketing funnel as we've known it for decades. Classic right out of business school. Awareness, interest, sale. Or there's a lot of other pieces that can be put in there. Now, I love this book by Joseph Jaffe. Uh, and he wrote Flipping the Funnel. So it's not just about marketers bringing information back down, but also getting customers to share it out. And he's right. So if you take this one diagram on the left, which is the top part of the funnel, and then the bottom part of the funnel, he's flipped it underneath, that really shows the entire customer experience. And this is it. So we call this the customer hourglass. And this is a framework I want you to draw into your notes right now and think about in your mobile strategy by the end of today is you want to check off against all seven of these phases. Does your mobile strategy align with all seven? Your goal as a strategist that's why we're here today at Mobile Strategy Summit, is to make sure that everything that you do covers all of these pieces. This is a bigger discussion than platforms, features, technology. 
It's thinking about your customer first. Now, you're probably wondering, how do I get started? Seven pieces is a lot to get, to get moving. Well, the first thing you want to do is poll your customers and conduct market research. And so I know there's at least four market research firms that are sponsors and partners of this event. So there's a lot of folks that can help. And you want to ask your customers, which platforms are they using? How do they use these tools in the context of this customer hourglass? And how do they use those components that we talked about in the last thing? So those three questions you have to answer for each of the personas that you're trying to reach. So do market research first and understand how do customers use mobile in the context of this cycle. Once you understand their mobile graphics, then you can start to align those components that I talked about in the last piece right against this framework. And then you can build a strategy, a mobile strategy based upon your customers' needs rather on the latest platform or technology. So this is how you build a mobile strategy with this framework first. In the next few sections, I'm going to go through all seven of the phases. I'll define what they are. And I'm going to give you some examples of what some of the top brands in the world are doing right now. And then I'm going to give you a few summation points on actionable pieces that you can take back and get started right now. Let's jump in. So the first one, awareness. This is just getting your customer aware that you're out there and you offer products. And in most cases that we see out there, a lot of the focus is on the lifestyle or the pain points. If you're in B2B, it's work style. But it's talking about the things that are paining them and they're trying to accomplish in their lives. And that's very different than introducing your product or your brand. So it's talking about what's important to them first. So as you're building out your mobile applications and your strategy, think about, now, what pain point does our product or service actually fix? And whatever that pain point is, that's what you want to do to make sure you hit this first phase. I like this. Um, this is called Gate Guru, and this is an application you can download. And if you've ever seen Yelp or TripAdvisor, it's like that, but for airports. Now, if you look at any of the data on, on Yelp or, uh, or Foursquare, there's so many different pieces of fragmented information at every terminal. This application is trying to centralize that all into one place. So when you get off a plane, like I always do every week, and then you can see what are the top restaurants and stores right within that specific area. Now, one of the benefits around this is what, <laughs> what we call, uh, what I call, uh, our OPC. Are you down with OPC? Other people's content. Are you down with OPC? Thank you. OK, you guys are around in the 90s. I know you're a young bunch. Uh, <laughs> and, and the goal here is to utilize the crowd to do some of the work for you. So this is a combination of a mobile app with ratings and review features and encouraging people to upload their own content and reviews in real time. So Gate, Gate Guru is tied to the awareness portion. And they also offer contextual advertising, which ties into this. A big part of the awareness phase is often paid media. So advertising is a strong way to reach this. And you want to make sure we hit all of these phases. So this is one by Facebook. So as you check into a specific location using their applications, or maybe even their, their .m, um, you can see that very can you see? OK, you can't see on this one. Um, there's a very specific little orange mark or yellow mark, and it says there's a potential deal nearby. So this is an example of paid media right on social using web, so all three components put together. Now, if you've seen Altimeter's research on how companies spend on social, the first spend is on labor and people. The second is on advertising. So we're already seeing a lot of the money shift to the advertising space. I was with a large hospitality retailer. Uh, yesterday, and he said he, that, that Facebook ads were performing very well for him, uh, way better than other types of advertisements. So this is how you want to utilize some of these technologies. Speaking of lifestyle, this is an app that talks about what it's like to get up in the snow. So this is uh, North Face provides snow report. 
So it has weather information, the powder, uh, so you know where you can go. And this is all in the context of their products, but it's not pushing products. It's talking about the pain point and the lifestyle. You can also see the tweets from the resorts as people connect with each other. Anybody have a dog? I do. If you go to Twitter, his, he's a at good boy rumba. Uh, he's very feisty, uh, despite the fact that he's 10 pounds and white and fluffy. <laughs> I'm, I'm manly. And uh, so Nestle Perina knows that manly, manly guys like me want to go places with their cute little dog. And they built this app that helps to find lifestyle-related content and stores and beaches and trails that are pet-friendly. And this is all related to the context of the lifestyle. So just to summarize that first phase of awareness, the location data will provide context so your advertising becomes more efficient. This is how you want to use location data plus your traditional advertising to really increase click-throughs. Now, later I'm going to talk about advocacy, which is the last phase. If you do advocacy really well, and we'll come back to this, you actually reduce your costs here on awareness because you're getting your customers to do it for you. We'll come back to that. So expect that paid media will absolutely help this first phase. So that's getting them in the door. Next phase. This is consideration. And this phase, your customers have identified they have a pain. And they know that there's different solutions that they can compare in order to figure out what will they do in the next phase. So consideration phase, take this uh, example is shop alerts. And this is a SMS feature that notifies your customers when a new deal is, in. and it's always opt in. So think of it as direct marketing using SMS. Now, most marketers don't integrate this. You want to have this available at the stores, kiosks, at point of purchase, on the website, even on social sites. So make sure you tie this around all of the digital touch points and real world touch points so consumers can connect to this. What's interesting is they also add the geolocation data around it. So when you're in a specific region, they'll give you those specific uh, data points. So it's, it's more specialized in the content that it's giving. And they call that geofences, place cast. Now, let's talk about pain. Now, if you're a guy, shopping for rings is painful. And any uncle or father will tell you, never take your fiance to the diamond store with you. Do your research first, or you will get took. Uh, because the sales guys know exactly how to upsell. It's very easy for them. So a savvy buyer of diamond rings. Oh, real quick question. This was something in business school we always debated. Are diamonds a necessity or a luxury item? <laughs> yes, we don't need to ask. It is a necessity. Uh, it propagates, uh, for better or for worse, it propagates uh, uh, procreation. So it is a necessity. <laughs> wow, that went off track. <laughs> so back to our our poor, our poor gentleman who is thinking about, wow, I'm going to spend four to five figures on an uh, inanimate object. How, wh which was the right one? This is very confusing. Four Cs? What, what's going on? So this application, which is on an iPad, and this is in the consideration phase, allows for the gentleman to find out the size of the ring of his fiance's best friend. See, you want to do that ahead of time and find out what's the size that she was looking at and likes. And you can actually take that ring and put it up right to the screen, and there's a sizing application right here that helps define the actual the size. So this is taking product inventory and allowing the consumers to look at both of these pieces. Now, let's keep on going on our journey here with our young couple. She didn't say yes yet, but we like what GE did here, and this is called the moodometer. And the moodometer allows for you to adjust the lighting, customized in the consideration phase, she's considering, uh, inside of your house. And you take a picture with your phone, and then you're able to select the different uh, variables on what your, your room could actually look like in real time. It's a form of AR. Cozy, creative, motivated, intimate, peaceful, or dramatic. 
I'd select a couple if it's a special day, right? And so it allows you to pick out and make the experience just perfect. So it's taking product inventory and putting it into multiple places on your mobile device that you can share. And then moving along, okay, ignore the one on the left. Let's talk about the one on the right. It's time to look at buying a home. She said yes. And we're definitely seeing that there are these QR codes uh, on both products as well as on real estate in order to find things. Now, in my opinion, I'm somewhat bearish on QR codes. I actually think that anytime we have consumers using machine language, that's an opportunity for new technology to merge to actually translate it. So I think over time, QR codes will become less relevant. They serve a very important need, and I know the adoption in Japan is very strong. But over time, technology will improve and we will move past machine language. So QR codes are an example of humans trying to use machine language. This is not something we can read. We have to use a machine to translate it. Now, if you're thinking about purchasing real estate, Regis provides this AR application, and they put all of their inventory on these different pieces, and then as you're using your phone, you can start looking around at the prices, size of different properties for commercial or real estate. This is fantastic use for that consideration phase. So to close out this piece, consideration, take your product inventory and put it on your mobile strategy, if that's the phase you're trying to fulfill, and allow them to opt in, which will move them down into the next phase, and don't overinvest in machine language. Look for the new technologies that will make it seamless for consumers to connect to each other. All right, let's move on. We're moving down the funnel. This next one is intent. And this means they're intending to buy and they have chosen you. They know that you have the best products that are gonna fulfill their needs in their life or in their workplace. So, Thinking about our couple moving forward, the target shopper, they've gotten married and now they have a, a baby or a wedding coming up. So remember they used to have, the, they have actually I think they still have the, the large guns where you go around and go beep, beep, beep. Mobile devices are going to replace those. So you can use applications right on your phone to select all those pieces and create your own favorite list, your own shopping cart of what you want, with customer, uh, what you want from your friends and family to buy for you. And it has a social element because you're sharing it with other people that you want to purchase those products. Now, our couple is now even having kids. So you can use this iPad app to drag and drop and allow the children to drag and drop your favorite products right into this shopping list, right into this cart, right into these favorites. The parents can edit it on out and move it out. Where's Toys R Us? I know they're in the house. Okay. I saw it on the list, and uh, I know Steve Lazarus, uh, the, the new social guy, so I just wanted to say hi. Or you could take ShopRite. You can, this is a, a really easy way if you have people that are shopping for you. So if the husband is going to the market on behalf of the wife, sometimes I do that. Oh, by the way, I tried to convince my wife that all green things were sold out. It didn't work. Vegetables. Uh, didn't work. Uh, so she could use one of these apps uh, and she could actually update it in real time about what she wants. Don't forget the milk, get the honey, get the meat, and get the vegetables. And these apps start to sync between each other, making it very easy for the consumer to buy um, when on site. So in this phase, the intention phase, the goal is to reduce the friction and allow the purchasing to happen in very few clicks. Uh, whilst it's still very early, uh, last year we did a conference on social commerce on how this data is tying together in mobile. So we're already seeing that information starting to come together. Now, we think that in the future that these, your, the consumer shopping list will be pre-populated based upon their social data and their social profile and the things they've done in the past. So imagine that uh, the gentleman's, my, app, my shopping list when I go to the store is populated with the things based upon historically that we've bought. So all these things will start to tie together in the supply chain. So finally, we're at point of purchase. And many of us are measured directly on this one. This is a very important piece. And the point of purchase is, I think I see two interesting things that are happening. Uh, one of them is that it's 
helping uh, purchases to happen faster. So anywhere you see a line, like a physical line, this is where you want to apply this, these types of strategies. The other thing that I think is interesting is consumers will prepay or post-pay. They will pay later for your products. That's a trend that we're starting to start to think about. Prepay, this is an example here. So over 3 million have paid with Starbucks mobile app. And you can load in, you can load in credits, and then you can purchase uh, on demand. I think you can actually start to order your, uh, your, your drinks, Frappa Mochicino or whatever, uh, when you're in the back of the line. So it starts to speed the supply chain up. Now, the interesting thing that I, I'm going to start to see happen is about paying later. So if you, if eventually we're going to start to see applications where you can use virtual currency to tie into the, the reducing this, the cost of products. We'll talk about gamification uh, in the advocacy section. Now, it's not limited to Starbucks, but you can easily refill your prescriptions at Walgreens. It's so confusing deals, dealing with these types of tools. So using all augmented reality to tie in the actual, looking at the actual, the, using the application to look at the medicine bottle, and then it will automatically scan it and get that information going. So by the time you're in the car and you get to the, the, the retail store, you're ready to pick these things up. Over one million customers have subscribed to using these things. Now, if you're at the point of purchase, you don't want to have a bad experience by not having inventory on site. So I like what Crate and Barrel has done to figure out, does that actual store, that inventory, have it right there and you can purchase? In the future, I would, exp I would expect that you can prepay, use the mobile device, and by the time you get to the store, somebody brings it to you and puts it in your trunk. You don't even have to get out. So this is applying mobile uh, data to the overall supply chain. It's not fully happening now. What we definitely see is you order online, Safeway brings it to you. But as cars start to develop GPS tools, like I got a tour of the, the sync in the Ford pieces, and I also talked to OnStar, we're seeing all these data pieces are starting to come together. The routing, this is the future supply chain. And if you're into high-end fashion and you want to get discount deals, the Guilt Group is providing an, an iPad app where you, they're 4% of their sales and it's continuing to increase is coming right from these actual apps right at point of purchase. Now, the takeaways on this phase, and this is one of the most important phases we deal with, is to remember that the point of purchase is no longer limited to, limited to the physical location. And what we're starting, we've already seen prepaying that's already happening, but start to see that postpaying based upon your influence scores and credit. So imagine somebody has a high influence score or has purchased things in the past. I would start to expect that people will offer products to them very quickly in order for them to take it home with them and, and just charging them later because these tools make it so easy to grab these pieces. And I expect that people will use social currency. So one that's starting, a shiny object that's emerged that people are, uh, I'm definitely looking at is the gamification space. So social influence from clout to peer index to the, the new one that's emerged, uh, Empire Avenue. And it starts to measure how much influence do you have amongst your peers. Well, I expect that those pieces of currency will start to give discounts to, to consumers if you have a high influence score in order to get them to buy your product because you're more likely to tell others. So the key point here is buying products are not limited to a location. Payment can happen before, during, or after. And we'll start to see social currency being used to buy different products. So the way that we think about purchasing is definitely changing. Now here's where marketers tend to stop. And my mission today, uh, the, the message I'm trying to give is to think about the whole customer life cycle, this whole hourglass. So don't just stop at point of purchase, but keep on going. Because what happens towards the bottom, you can see support, loyalty, and advocacy. What happens in support turns into marketing. So we can't ignore what's happening after the point of purchase. This is an opportunity for us on our careers, by the way. We can think broader across the whole company of the entire customer life cycle. So I like what USAA did two years ago to increase support. So you can take 
uh, physical pictures of your physical check, and then you can use that to cash in, then you can tear up your check and dispose of it. You don't even have to go to the ATM. They make it so easy to do customer support wherever you are. Chase followed this in 2010. Now, if you're a frequent traveler, some of the apps from airlines like Delta make it so easy to figure out how to check in paperless and to find out is your flight on time at which gate. So making it easy for customers to support each other post-purchase should be part of your strategy. Or AAA, taking that physical card. And what you can do is punch in, if you're stuck on the roadside, the issues you have, flat tire, um, out of gas. And it'll send information directly through the app to the support center. And then they'll call you back and let you know that we heard you. We're on the way to help you. This reduces the time you, uh, spent waiting on a, on a phone system and reduces support costs because you're getting them to do it on their own. The web is one of the top web conferences in Europe. And they do a fantastic job with their applications that allow their members to connect and find each other using LinkedIn data or to find the maps or the physical, physical locations. So this support mechanism can even apply to physical events. So to take away uh, for the support section here is reduce your support costs by giving them the information on hand. And when you think about this strategy, I encourage you to think about it in three phases. There's three tiers. So the first tier, oh, sorry, I have to advance. Uh, so the first tier is, um, is make sure that the information is there for them to self-help. Load up the most frequently asked questions first. Use a tiered approach. The second phase you want to do is allow for, allow for them to connect to each other, peer-to-peer -peer support. So Q&A, wikis, uh, FAQs that they ask and answer to each other. And then finally, this is more expensive, is to do that direct level of support. So when they can contact you directly, and that actually costs a lot more when all of these other ones are, are done. Now, if you can help your company measure that you've reduced support costs by doing those first two tiers, self-help and then peer-to-peer, -peer, you're, you're really increasing the experience of your customers and saving your company money. And this is beyond marketing. So think about how this expands beyond just pre-purchase. So moving into these sections here, and we have less examples. It's still starting to emerge is loyalty programs. And these certainly tie in with mobile and social. So is Starbucks here today? So this is one of the first examples that we saw is Starbucks purchased this badge from Foursquare. And the rumor on the street is around, it was around $50,000 to get that little JPEG or GIF. And you're probably, that seems like a lot. Actually, that was a complete steal. That was a total deal. Because you got your customers to fight to become the mayor on Foursquare and tell all of their friends that they're at the store in order to just receive a free drink. So this is a great way to foster loyalty by tying in the mobile data with checking in and around using gamification. I think this is a great example for the thousands of stores this scaled out. In this iPad app, from Kraft. It's actually, there's a cost to it. It's 99 cents. It comes loaded with recipes. And next to each of the recipes, they recommend Kraft products. But why would you pay 99 cents for just this content? Well, there's a ton of coupons that are added next to that. So it makes it easy for customers to stay loyal to this product because the recipes and the products and the, the coupons are all loaded up. Of course, this information gives a lot of intelligence back to Kraft. And they're gathering all this information up to understand what are, are people cooking nowadays and what are the pieces that they're using to use as coupons to understand the hot spots in their marketplace. So this goes back and ties into the supply chain information. So loyalty programs. In the past, they were just focused on long-term commitment with your customers and the total potential value of how much they'll spend. But in the future, you have to factor in loyalty their social influence as well. So are they, and, and tying in with that, these loyalty programs are going to involve gaming, where the social capital is tied in. 
So as they interact with your different websites, maybe they receive points. As they receive more points, they get new badges. And those badges give them recognition with a, as social currency. And this all ties into each other to increase loyalty. Recognition is a new aspect tied into loyalty programs. So the last phase, you've been great. We've been going through all these systematic phases. It's to tie in advocacy. And notice, advocacy is another A, and it's at the bottom of the hourglass. It actually feeds awareness if you do this right. But in order to get advocacy, you have to do the support side right. Because if you have bad products, and they're going to give you negative word of mouth, and that part of your funnel starts to decrease. So in order to get advocacy, which is the holy grail of marketing, because it travels the fastest, it's the lowest cost, and the most trusted. That is the holy grail is advocacy. But in order to get there, you have to do the bottom part of that funnel correct, support, and loyalty. Now, these all feed into each other. This is why this is a mobile strategy, is that the advocacy piece will feed awareness at the top and start that cycle for you over and over. So the message I'm trying to give here is, if you do this right and look at all these pieces together, you will have a, a pretty much a consistent amount of investment, but the increase should happen and, and grow and grow as you tie mobile and social together. Tasty Delight out of New York is a um, frozen yogurt place. And and they have a rewards card, but every time you use the rewards card, you can earn extra points if you tell your friends. So it has Facebook, Twitter, and Foursquare connections into it, and as at, your, at, the, at the actual event, and you purchase it, you can share with your friends and earn extra points. So a couple of factors into play, mobile, social, gamification, all leading up to loyalty and advocacy, putting all those pieces towards that bottom of the hourglass. We don't see a lot of examples of this happening fully fleshed out. So you can see the top of the funnel is really early. We'll do more studies into this over time. But remember that this advocacy piece is the holy grail of marketing, lowest cost, and yet highest tr trusted. And when done correctly, it feeds the rest of the funnel of the hourglass towards the top. So my message today is for you to think about this hourglass and apply it as you go back to work tomorrow. Draw it out. This is the first thing where you start. Uh, you draw out this piece. Then you understand the mobile graphics of your consumers. How do they actually use these technologies? Just to remind you, which platforms are they on? Which behaviors do they use? And then which are the components, those features that we looked at? There's, we, I showed five, there's more. And once you have that data, you can start to mat match it to this hourglass, and then you come up with a mobile strategy. And this is how you approach it, thinking about your business goals, your customer life cycle, and how they're behaving, rather than starting with technologies first. So start with the customer experience first, and that truly is a strategy. So just to summarize, conduct research now, and do it on a regular basis. Every six months, every year, every year, pull your consumers or get secondary market research on how they're using these tools. You want to break it out by different personas. I've done a lot of this on the social side when I was at Forrester, social technographics. Next, you're going to have to talk to other people within the company to understand their needs as well. Factor in support, product teams, loyalty programs, and eventually, the supply chain group and any distributors or retailers if you're CPG, retail, or hospitality. So think beyond marketing. We have to anyways, because your mobile strategy will be more effective if you add in support and advocacy. And remember, you want to use these data types in a lot of different ways, in deadly combination from social to location uh, to whatever comes next. Use all the pieces together yields additional bonuses and value back to the consumers. So thanks a lot. I'd like to open it up to some questions. We have a few minutes left. And uh, uh, Megan's going to run the mic around. We can take about three or four questions. If you, if you have a question, raise your hand or, or let me know so I can come over with a microphone. Right here. OK, great. Thank you. If you introduce yourself, I'd love to just say hi. 
Thank you. I'm Shannon from Trend Micro. Hi. You talked about support and um, a lot of apps that we're all working with are free or at a fairly low cost. Have you? What kind of trends have you seen in providing support where it's cost effective for the vendor, but also satisfactory, you know, for the user? Because it's something that maybe more in more in the B two B space as well. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm like B two C, and and it's you know how to communicate with them, how to respond to to them on um, like the Android market, their feed, you know, how to provide feedback for them. Um, in-app like chat or like help support. I'm just just things like that. Like I don't know what you're seeing. Yeah, we're definitely not seeing a lot of like uh, real-time chat apps appear right on these. It's it, the more effective way and it's lower cost is repurposing your existing knowledge base or the the content out, out of your communities and just publishing that and across aggregating that within the app. And uh, many of the, so my main focus is uh, on the social space. So many of the community platform providers like Jive or Lithium now have mobile applications. So if you have an existing community, that, your own branded community that's been in place, or even some of the, the uh, social media management systems that publish on Facebook and have support, you can start to repurpose those right into the, the mobile uh, applications right now. So those often already exist. So try to tap into that because the data is already being spread. Uh, and captured over there. Great. Sure. Hi, Jeremiah. I'm Linda Hi. from Volvo. Um, you talked earlier about the clout score. How important do you think that is, and where do you think it's going? Oh, this is a good topic. I'm glad you brought, brought this one up. Topic. Yeah. OK. <laughs> this, is a, this is a controversial topic. So actually, I want to poll the audience. Um, how many of you think that we should treat consumers differently based upon their clout scores? Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. How, how many of you think all consumers should be treated equally? Raise your hand. OK, so, and many of you didn't raise your hands. So here's the debate. Do we involve uh, social influence in, into the way we treat customers? And my answer is absolutely yes. We have to look at that. Take, for example, Southwest Airlines. And they had a major influencer, Kevin Smith, on their plane. And he was tweeting in real time how he was having a, a horrible experience. For whatever reason, it, it doesn't matter. But the thing is, if Southwest Airlines would have known during check-in that this individual had over a million Twitter followers, then they could have uh, escalated that, pro uh, that process and fixed it quicker. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to treat uh, consumers better because they have that uh, high influence, because that could actually propagate a very bad uh, situation where influencers are just demanding things all the time from brands. So you want to use that on a case-by-case -case basis. But the end goal is we have to factor in influence. And you know what? This is nothing new, because we already look at consumers of high net worth, and we treat them already better. I guess the, and I hear what you're saying, yeah. I agree. Um, but you know, coming from a brand that's a very inclusive brand, it's really hard to say that one customer is more important than another. Well, I didn't say important, but we do have to understand that they need to be treated differently, maybe faster. So OK, here's, a, here's what I'm seeing happening. So Salesforce. They've gotten rid of like PR, AR, uh, MR, uh, analyst relations, PR, and they just call it one bucket, influencer relations. So that's the change now. Yeah. So we're definitely seeing that as a change because it's hard to even tell like what is an analyst. You know, are they a blogger? Do they write reports? Do they speak? I mean, or who? What's media? They have blogs now too. So the the, the big change is like it's just influencer relations. No, I think clout is, is, is not effective and complete. Clout only factors in Facebook and Twitter data, and it doesn't factor in sentiment. So when Kenneth Cole did his debacle, you probably saw my post on this, um, his clout score went up 40 points because it's looking at the interaction on Twitter and Facebook. But in reality, most of the tweets were saying, you should go away and you, we hate you. So it, it doesn't factor in sentiment. These tools are not complete yet. So it's still very early. So in many cases, you have to put together multiple pieces of algorithms. But we should expect in your back to the mobile strategy that as we start to identify consumers, that they will start to add in this amount of influence into the interaction so you can figure out who they are. Um, I think it's just the way it is. OK, maybe one or two more questions. One over here. Hey, Ed Felix with VML. Um, 
you mentioned kind of at the end there kind of how the, the cloud score um, eventually will be able to drag that into kind of like our mobile applications. Yes. But when we're talking about developing for a mobile strategy, um, this treating people differently according to your cloud score, what is the best approach to obtaining that kind of information and dragging that into you know the, your property in whether that's your mobile website or your yeah. you know application? So in the, in the back end, and we didn't talk about this, in and the very baseline is a CRM system that has all your customer data. And uh, companies are already starting to add in fields for their Twitter account, Facebook account, and maybe even clout and whatever, peer index and whatever comes next. So that's the first step, is to centralize it into one location, rather than just waiting for the third party to do that. So you need to start collecting that now. Uh, you can even give customers rewards as they add in this and self-opt-in. And by the way, email still is the primary key to figure all these pieces out, because you can't start a social network without an email account. So that, that's still the main piece. So to answer your question is uh, start centralizing all of that, the influence data on your own customer databases first. And then you can parse it out to mobile, web, social, and whatever digital property comes next. I'm thinking long term, right? You know, a bigger plan out there. Does that help? Great. Do we, do we have one more question? Great. Thank you right. so much for having me. And make sure you fill your whole hourglass out. Thank you. I'm Jeremiah. Thank you, Jeremiah. <laughs>